Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafaroff. This show is designed to highlight the work of philanthropic leaders here in the United States and then beyond. Today with us, Rosita Romero. Rosita is the co-founder and the executive director of the Dominican Women's Development Center. The Dominican Women's Development Center is the largest Dominican organization in the United States. Rosita, thank you so much for joining Successful Philanthropy. And Rosita, I want to start with your beginnings because I understand you came to the United States when you were 17 years old. You did not know how to speak English. And now all of a sudden, well, many years later, you're the executive director. It's a real success story. Talk a little bit about your beginnings, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Jean, for inviting me to your wonderful program. And um, when I came uh, to the United States, I was 18 years old. I uh, came to the University of Connecticut. The, uh, I'm sorry, I came to the University of New Haven in Connecticut and um, I didn't know how to speak English, but I studied the whole summer from nine to five. I took learning English as a, a, a job and I was able to uh, learn it in, in a couple of months. Before that, at the University of Puerto Rico, the textbooks were in um, English. So I had a good comprehension. Reading and comprehension was good. It was my conversational English that needed a lot of improvement. And then you started the Dominican Women's Development Center when you were 28. And as I recall, you were a group of nine or ten women sitting around a table and you decided to start an organization to help Back then it was Dominican women, and now today, I understand you help all women and all children, 10,000 to be exact. This is a real success story. And how did that actually begin? Yes, um, we wanted to respond to the conditions uh, that uh, Dominican and other Latina women were facing in New York City. Uh, most of us were living in the community of Washington Heights and Inwood in Manhattan and also in the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. And back then there was uh, uh, a lot of drugs in the neighborhood, uh, housing was beginning to increase, a lot of the women as immigrants were being underpaid and uh, we wanted to create an organization to improve our condition and at the same time to promote a uh, different role for women because 33 years ago, a lot of the women um, were still in a subservient roles at home. Uh, we had a lot of machismo. The men wanted to uh, uh, be the head of the household and have everybody, women and children, do as they pleased. But uh, we felt that as, as women, we could make a, a different type of contribution to society. And those of us who chose to have a career and work and other goals and enjoy life, have leisure, travel, and uh, self-realize ourselves in different ways that uh, we wanted an organization to contribute to that. And so you created this organization. And today, this was 33 years ago. Now today, what are those problems still facing most women, I think conditions have improved, but I think in many cases, women still have a situation where, well, right now in our country, pay parity does not exist. The Equal Rights Amendment is not part of our Constitution. So where have you gone from where you began 33 years ago? Yes, uh, there has definitely been a lot of improvement. And I believe that we have contributed. We have made our small contribution to that because we have done a lot of advocacy and a lot of uh, programs uh, through the media to encourage women to uh, become more active in, in, the, in the community, to become ag agents of change in their own lives. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, the, the, there is still problem. There's still no equality. 
And that is the mission of the organization, to promote gender equality and social justice for all women, like you said, not only Latina. And that's a very important role or objective, I should say. Now, back to when you were 28 years old, you were a group of women sitting around a table, and someone came up with an idea, and I understand you collected $30? <laughs> that is correct. The organization was uh, co-founded by nine women. And uh, we presented the programs that we wanted to see in the community. And one of the women, uh, Mireya Cruz, who is now an honorary member of the uh, board of directors of the Dominican Women's Development Center, she said, if we want to have a nonprofit organization that is going to be long lasting, we have to have a budget. And that's where uh, she asked all of us to give a dollar. Uh, symbolically as our first budget. So we passed around the hat, we collected $30. And that's how we started the organization with uh, $30 and a dream. And right now we have a budget of $5 million. We have six different programs, uh, 80 employees, and we provide services to uh, approximately 10,000 women and their families every year. And this is really a success story. and a success story for creating good for 10,000 people. Yes. The group you serve, is it just Manhattan or is it Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens? Who do you it's, serve exactly? It's uh, uh, mostly uh, Northern Manhattan and the Bronx. However, we do have uh, women and children that uh, uh, come from Brooklyn, from Queens, from different parts of the city. And through our hotline and our uh, phone services and now through our Zoom services, we do reach out to the entire city of New York. And what's the biggest problem that your people are faced with, the people you serve? There's so many problems that the community is still facing. Uh, discrimination is certainly one of them. Uh, we have a problem of an immigrant community that where we have a large number of undocumented people. Uh, poverty is still a problem in our communities uh, because uh, uh, the, the, the disparities that, that, that we have in society normally, uh, unfortunately, people of color are the lowest paid and they do the hardest uh, uh, jobs. And because of that, we, we have uh, uh, to continue working with our community. Uh, there are a lot of health problems and that has to do either with people not being um, insured uh, or not having health insurance or not having access to uh, services, to health services because of the language or uh, because uh, of, the, uh, of the conditions that they are living in. Uh, so uh, definitely those, those, are, those are some of, some of the bigger problems, uh, immigration, health, education. A lot of our women are, are still not getting enough scholarship to be able to afford college. And the cost of education has increased tremendously. So that makes it harder for our community to access that. And the gap continues to widen because of it. Which is not good. Now, I understand of the $5 million budget, the government provides a lot of that, most of that funding, which means to me, Rosita, that you have to be doing something very right because the government just doesn't hand over money to a charity. They do it because you're doing a good job at what you're doing. Yes, 85% uh, of our funding comes from government. And uh, you are right, at the beginning, our first grant was only $1,500. And then we started getting dra grants of uh, 15, 20, 25, and 250. And it's amazing because if you, they don't see that history of you being able to manage a certain amount of funds, they're not going to give you more. And right now we have a program that is uh, our early Head Start is a million dollars. Come, come from the federal government. And then because of that, then we were able to get other grants for our child care centers that are $2 million. Uh, part of the challenges that we have with government funding is that it arrives late. 
it is given to us on a reimbursement basis. We have to upfront the money, provide the services, and then they reimburse us. And sometimes they reimburse us late. And that is why we need to raise funds from private foundations and individuals like yourself so that we can have that unrestricted cushion to provide the services and then we get reimbursed out by the government. Yes, and all charities need to raise money from individuals, from corporations and private foundations, even if they're government funded. It's very, very important. So how do you go about raising this money? I'm on the board of New York Women's Foundation. I know we give you funding. You, you've applied for a grant and New York Women's Foundation gives you funding. But how do you go out there? I know I'm a volunteer fundraiser. I know what it's like, but I want to hear how Rosita and the Dominican Women's Development Center raises funding, funds. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I wanted to mention that the first grant that we received from a foundation was from the New York Women's Foundation in 1989, when the foundation was only a year old. So we are part of the first uh, grantees in the first cycle of the foundation. And, and I'm really proud of that because there is still a history that there is a connection. We have received several grants throughout the year and I'm still connected to many people uh, uh, in the foundation like yourself and, and others on the board. And of course, Anna Oliveira, the wonderful and dynamic Anna Oliveira. The but, president. Yeah, the yeah, president she's of terrific. the terrific. Yes, yes. A wonderful woman. And she's been on this show quite a few times. Yes, yes. But fundraising is an art, Jean. I believe that for me, I learned it from my mother because she used to buy us a gift to raffle. And she said, you have to learn to make money. So she, she, uh, we got a, a gift uh, uh, that she paid for, and then whatever we raised from the raffle, we got to keep as children. So the concept of fundraising is something that I learned at home from the time I was like 10 years old. And uh, uh, that's what fundraising is about. It's about selling a product. It's about telling a story. It's about convincing people that what you are investing, it's going to have a result that is going to benefit other people in the case of philanthropy. And, and it's uh, important for the charity to show the results. And of course, since I've done a lot of volunteer fundraising, a no today could mean a big yes tomorrow. So if, if you're out there fundraising for a charity and someone says no, well, next year that person might change their mind and want to give. So always be polite, always be nice, and thank people even when they say no. Because a no today could be a yes tomorrow. <laughs> that, right? that, 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 that is correct. Uh, 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 perseverance, it's one of the key things in, uh, uh, in fundraising. But you need to know also when to back down. And if you find someone just lost a job, someone is going through a divorce, well, it's probably not the right time to ask for money. Exactly, yes. And what you do is that you support that person in, at the time but, and you let them know we understand that maybe next year or another time, however it takes them to, to, to recuperate, then, then you come back. And also there are different ways in which people can help organizations, not only with money, volunteer work. Uh, uh, it's, it's another w w way that we like people to get involved with our organization. And how many volunteers do you have working for your organization? Um, we have between 50 and 60 volunteers because each program has six programs and each program has about uh, five to ten volunteers and uh, people are, are able to help with different projects from giving out food to the community to uh, helping people learn language to coming to our daycare center and reading to the children and promoting uh, literacy and, uh, and the love of reading in our children, which is yes, so important. And, uh, being a volunteer is a very important part of being a philanthropist and many people don't have the funds to give away large sums of money but they have the time and the knowledge. And I say to everyone watching this show, never underestimate the value of what you can do. We all can be acting philanthropists. 
And one of the most important things we can do is volunteer our time and, and, and also our knowledge. For our audience, we are with Rosito Romero. She is the executive director and co-founder of the Dominican Women's Development Center. And Rosita, I want to backtrack a little. We were talking about problems confronting your organization and the world. How did you manage during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, yes. Um, during the pandemic in March of last year, the management team made a very timely decision to provide services remotely because our main concern was uh, the safety of our employees and also of the community. The, the mandate was to stay home and uh, we helped to continue to provide services by providing remote services. All our services were remote. We were able to do the classes, the training, um, uh, work with the children uh, remotely. We were able to, uh, through the New York City Board of Education, get iPads for all our children have iPads. And then our teachers taught them from home the routines of how they could learn every day. Our uh, staff was so dedicated that uh, they uh, uh, went as far as bringing people groceries to their door. And that way people didn't have to leave their home and people were making a sacrifice, but there was, it was, we still developed a system of no contact. So we you were bring, helping people, we, yes. not only with, I assume, education, you were teaching the young children. What do you teach the young children? Yes, well, we have an early Head Start program and uh, we, it's a home-based program. We work with 72 families and it's a school readiness program. We introduced the early concept of literacy, uh, reading, uh, writing, uh, painting, a lot of creative arts, and uh, helping children also to, uh, with their social uh, uh, motivational mm -hmm. skills and uh, so that they can learn how to you know, interact in public, uh, 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 relate to other children uh, without fighting, socializing, introducing the concept of sharing, the importance of washing the hands, and the importance of reading. So we work a lot with the parents as the first teachers in the children's life. And by doing that, we are helping to prepare the children to succeed in school. No question, you're helping the whole family. Correct, absolutely. Which is wonderful. And when you were teaching the children virtually during the pandemic, was the response strong or did people sort of? We had a strong response because of the methodology that we used. For instance, what we did in the morning was we had a 30 minutes of instruction. And then after that, we had an hour break. And then we came back to another 30 minutes of instruction because uh, when you are home, parents have other things to do. So you found that parents had to play the role of parents and teachers mm -hmm. at the same time. So you have to allow some time so that they could take care of their chores or uh, do whatever they have to do for work or in, in some cases attend work. So we had different, uh, uh, a, a total of only two and a half hours of instructions, but that gave time for the children to disconnect, to have some space, to run around a little bit and be children and for the parents to fulfill their other roles. Now, so, now we're done with, or not done, but we're, Almost Hopefully, done. almost oh, done yeah. with this pandemic, <laughs> yes. unless, of course, uh, the Delta variant, we have a breakout or there's another variant. And are you having classes now at your center? Yes, we are fully back in service. We're in person 100%, uh, taking the uh, proper precautions, of course. Uh, um, most of our staff and uh, uh, program participants are vaccinated. If they're not vaccinated, they have to show a negative test. They still have to wear masks. We still take temperatures. We have hand sanitizers and uh, hand washing uh, all the time. But yeah, we, we, we are back in, in services. Uh, uh, we're trying to adjust to the new norm and uh, be able to continue to function in society. We can't let this virus beat us. <laughs> I agree with you. And so far, yeah. I think most of the world has done okay, though there's been a tremendous suffering. And many, many people, we had at one point 38 million 
Americans out of work. And when people are out of work, that translates into no food on the table, n an, an ability not to pay rent, and mm -hmm. a whole host of problems. And hopefully, we're getting through those problems. And I love to hear what your organization is doing, because what you're doing is so very important. Now, for uh, I know you you have a fundraiser coming up, and I've been involved for quite a few years. I remember we had them in person, and they were quite beautiful, and a lot of fun. Last year it was virtual. What are you doing this year for our audience? I know what you're doing, but yeah, give us a little yeah, information. Of course, of course, yes. Like you mentioned, Jean, uh, we have to continuously do fundraising. And our main fundraiser is now in October. It is our anniversary. This year is the 33 years. So we are organizing our third anniversary. A 33rd anniversary gala, and it will take place on October 14th, uh, and it's going to be virtual. And this is coming up very soon. Yes, 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 but it's a wonderful program. Uh, we can have a wonderful program. We have uh, wonderful honorees, uh, presenters. We are very uh, uh, glad and, and fortunate that you are the chair of this <laughs> event and you uh, have been supporting us for the past uh, three or four years. Uh, like many other company, a lot of corporations are able to sponsor us. Uh, we have great honorees this year. Uh, the uh, main one is uh, Davina, Dabu, um, uh, Davina Pradu from uh, New York uh, Presbyterian Hospital. We have uh, Frankie Miranda, the president of the Hispanic Federation. Uh, many companies, uh, Cecilia Nelson from L'Oreal. Um, we have Kia Blake from the New York Liberty. And, uh, and many other. Many, many, many and you have Anne Delaney from New York Women's Foundation. Absolutely. And she is a great force and a very, very supportive woman in supporting other women. Yes, um, uh, Anne Delaney was actually the first honoree who responded. And uh, uh, she's been introduced by Yvonne Moore, who you know also from the New York Women's Foundations. And uh, she is, um, um, uh, Anne is making her contribution through the Starry Night Fund. And she, we, we're so happy to have her. Yes, now, if people want to donate to your organization or they want to get involved with this virtual gala, how do they do it? What's the website? The website is dwdc.org, dwdc.org. All the information about our wonderful programs and about the uh, gala is in there. You can RSVP, you can donate, um, you can ask questions, interact, get our full programs and also learn about all the different sponsorship opportunities that people have. Moving forward, you, when you think about future goals, if you had one dream, what, it would, what would it be for your organization? We would like to buy a building to have all of our programs under the same roof. Right now we have uh, three different sites. If we could have all our sites in one space, that, is a, that has been our dream. We have not been able to raise enough funds to make it happen. There have been challenges getting in from the government, but we don't give up. That is definitely uh, something that we would love to, ha to make it happen. And maybe you have to start a capital campaign, a, f um, a fundraising drive for a new building. It's a project. and. Right now, it's a little more difficult for many organizations, for many charities to raise money because we've just come out of this pandemic. And the problems facing most of the world still exist. Just because we're out of the, almost out of the pandemic, well, the problems still exist. And life is improving, of course. I'm very optimistic for the future. I think most of us are. But many people are still out of work and problems still exist. And so you're a very accomplished woman. You came, as you mentioned earlier, Rosita, 
from Dominican Republic at a young age. You were studying English in Puerto Rico before, at university before you came to the United States. Mm -hmm. You learned mostly written English at university. You came to the United States, and then you, you put your mind to learning how to speak English. What advice do you give to people coming to the United States who might feel very lost and they want to become a success? Yes. Well, uh, hard work, it's, it's very important. Having uh, clear uh, goals, uh, when you put your mind to something, uh, that's the first thing you need to do. You have to be clear about what are your goals, what are your objectives, and you have to work hard for it. And then you have to find support. You have to have a support network among your families, among friends in the community. Uh, uh, we, we live in community, and, and we, we succeed in community. So having that support is so important. It is important that we also uh, see ourselves as part of change for other people. Uh, we still have a lot of problems that at the societal level that we need to address. For us as women, we do not have equal pay for equal work. We have sexual harassment. We have a, a lot of other problems that we need to work with in coalition with other women. So part of it is setting personal goals, and another part is joining the efforts uh, at the community level to make sure that we and everybody else achieves that improvement in their lives. And I like your advice to people coming into this country who maybe don't know where to begin because it's got to be very difficult, for sure. Definitely. And you know, we in, in all our communities, we have those uh, matriarchs, uh, those women who have been strong, who have raised families, who have brought their families, who have been immigrants, who have been there for us, our mothers and grandmothers that we're so proud about. They work so hard to make sure that we achieve uh, uh, our um, uh, our goals, and, that, and that's part of what's very important for us. We have to honor our elders, our ancestors, those who came before us. And when we do that, we become more empowered. We get, more, we, we get the, the, the strength and the inspiration to move forward. Jean, something that is very important also for us to achieve our goal, we have to be spiritually connected with a higher okay. self. We are not in this world alone, and we do need that uh, energetic forces to p help us to push us forward and to get inspired to take care of us and the rest of the community. Like we expect that all those people that are watching this program will generously open up their heart so that they can help those of us who are trying to help ourselves. And you are a great role model, and you are a woman of great achievement, Rosita. We have about 10 seconds left. What would you like to leave this audience with? Uh, with a uh, word of gratitude, thank you for watching the program. Thank you for helping uh, thousands of women out there. Join us on October 14th virtually go to our website dwdc.org so that we can continue to help hundreds, thousands of other women and their families to improve their lives and achieve their dreams in this society. Rosita, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for the incredible work you're doing to change the lives of thousands and thousands of people. You are a great role model and a great hero. This concludes Successful Philanthropy. Our guest today, Rosita Romero. Rosita is the executive director and the co-founder of the Dominican Women's Development Center. I'm Jean Shafferoff, your host. I'll see you next week.